firstly apologise because I was late. I did not mean to be late. Um, let's just pray. Father, I thank you that you're with us. That I don't need all the words written down. Because you're going to speak to us through your spirit, Father. I just thank you for your presence here this morning. In Jesus' name. Oh my goodness. Okay, well I wanted to start with Psalm 91 because um, we're living in really uncertain times. Things are really changing. I'm quite shaken that the Supreme Court of New South Wales says that we have no freedoms or right except, rights except what the government will allow us. And I'm quite shaken by the legislation at the moment going through in Victoria that says that if somebody wants to change their gender and we pray for them, that we can go to jail. So yes, the world is changing and I think as we enter a new time for the church, in all of history, this is something so different that God uses these things to grow his church and we should not be afraid, but we should learn how God wants us to live and deal with the things that are going on around us. So Psalm 91 is, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty, and I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. I picked that psalm this morning because Katie and I had uh, decided that this was the psalm that we would memorise for October. We had a little bit of difficulty because we were memorising from two different translations, uh -huh. so we couldn't agree, like it really, <laughs> we couldn't agree on the words, which was really strange. And then we were at this prayer meeting and no one, uh, on Zoom, and no one knew that we were memorising this psalm. And somebody had a vision for Katie. And she said, I can see these massive arms coming around you. That's verse 4, Psalm 91. In the passion. And then they turned into feathers, which is verse 4 in the NIV. And I just thought, God just revealed to us that he was with us in everything that's going on. And my message this morning is we need to know that we know that we know the things that we know about God. Uh, because that is the thing that keeps us secure and keeps us moving forward. I have just a few little scriptures I've written down before I type my sermon. So we're going with that this morning. Um, one of the things about persecution which I believe is coming upon us. I think we've seen that already, in not being allowed to gather together, not being allowed to sing, that the church has been singled out for some things, um, and this is just the beginning. Is that the Bible tells us, Romans 5 says, we need to rejoice in our suffering, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance character and character hope. In fact, in James, it says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. And I think as a church, like I don't know how you have felt when you're not allowed to sing or you're not allowed to come to church. I have felt very isolated um, and cut off from people. Haven't been allowed to go to home group because you can't go if you're not vaccinated. So at the moment I can't even go and gather with people that we want to study the Bible together. Um, and that has made me feel something less than pure joy. But I want to tell you that we have not... We have no idea what persecution is because there are people on the planet this morning that if they get together and sing and worship God will pay for it with their lives. So we have very light affliction at the moment. But I wanted to pick out somebody from the Old Testament and somebody from the New to show how uh, God can empower us and help us to live and the things that are important for us to walk in this time to see great revival and to see people come to know God. So the first people I picked out were Shananiah, sorry, Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael, because their story is so familiar to us, but there is a key to their faith and their perseverance in what they did. So 
Here they are, they have been taken away, stripped away from their country, they have been indoctrinated with Babylonian culture and Babylonian theology, their names have been changed, their language has been changed, and now they have been separated uh, from their leader, Daniel. We don't know where Daniel is when we get to uh, chapter 3. Uh, I imagine that the people who have planned all this to destroy these three young men have had Daniel sent to somewhere else, so he's not there to be their support that day. And then, uh, here they are, and they're told, we've set up this golden image, when you hear the music, you must bow down and worship the golden image, or you're going to be thrown into the fire. So the music plays... And they are the only three people who do not bow down and worship the golden image. And so they're taken to the king. And the king, to start with, he thinks if he intimidates them, they would just change their mind. Because intimidation, that is just a tool that the enemy uses. Yes? So he says, well, if I'm going I'm to give you another chance. Um, we're going to play the music again and you're going to bow down and look at that image because if you don't, we're going to throw you into the fire. So Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they say to the king, it doesn't really matter what you say, king, because we will not bow down and worship the golden image or worship your God. But our God is able to save us. They knew that God could do anything and was able to save them. But if he doesn't, that's okay. Right? Because there will be in heaven with him. I've got the scriptures here. <laughs> they said if he doesn't save us, that's okay. And that's where I want to get to today that they knew God could save them because God is all-powerful. And that they knew if he didn't, that he was doing something better because God loves us, always looks after us. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. And so they were confident in who God was in that situation. And you know the end of the story, so they get thrown in the fire, Jesus walks around in the fire with them, the king is completely overwhelmed and calls them out of the fire and causes a decree to go throughout the whole of the world. This is the king of the entire known world to say that people should worship the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego because there is no other God who can save like that. So they stood on their faith on what they knew about Jesus and the end result was that many more people would get to hear about Jesus and get oh, saved. Brilliant. Yes? In the New Testament, we're going to look at Paul, because Paul has the moral authority to talk to us on this subject. I've got some scriptures here, 2 Corinthians 11. Paul says, I'm out of my mind telling you this like this. But he says, I've worked harder and I've been in prison more frequently, and I've been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and, and again. Five times I received the 40 lashes minus one. That's the 39 lashes they gave Jesus. It was designed if you were hit the 40th time that you were dead, so they had to have authority to kill you before they did 40 lashes. But they gave them 39 with the cat and nine tails, 13 on one shoulder to destroy the muscles, 13 on the other shoulder to destroy the muscles, and 13 down the spine, so your whole back was exposed. If you were then to be crucified, you did not have the strength, because there was no muscles left, to pull yourself up on the cross and breathe so that you could live. Five times Paul received that. Three times he was beaten severely with rods. Once he was stoned, we believe, I believe, when we read about how he was stoned, that he died. Um... Three times he was shipwrecked. Once he spent a whole day and a whole night floating around in the ocean. Now that would be a, that would be the scariest thing that I can think of is to spend 24 hours in the ocean waiting to be rescued or hoping to be rescued. 
He said, I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from the Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false believers. That's in danger from Christians in the church or people he thought were Christians in the church. He said, um, I have laboured and toiled and gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and often gone without food. I've been cold and naked and besides everything else, I have faced the pressure of my concern for all the churches. And Paul is qualified to tell us what we need to know, what the keys are to get through persecution. And most of us are never going to face anything like that ever in our lifetimes. I remember the only time I could say I was persecuted, and I remember this because it felt so bad, and it's so ridiculous. Um, I was selling lamingtons on a lamington drive for our church, and somebody from another church said to me, we're not going to buy you all lamingtons because you go to that church. <laughs> and I remember how bad that felt. And I look at Paul and I think, aren't I ridiculous? Aren't I just ridiculous? So Paul, um, at the end of his life, is in prison for the last time and he's awaiting persecution. He says, for the Spirit of God has not given us this... God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't be ashamed about being a Christian. Let's stand up, because we don't have a spirit of fear. He goes on to say, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, because he has saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because of anything we've done, but because of his own purpose and grace. That is why I'm suffering as I am. But this is no cause for shame, because I know whom I have believed. I know whom I have believed. And I believe this is the key to Paul's victory in his life, is that he knew exactly who God was, that God was who Jesus was who he said he was, that he would do what he said he would do, and there was no doubt. And I believe if we can stand on that firm foundation, that we can walk through anything. So um, we're going to Job. Job is a very interesting book. If you read the first two chapters and the last two chapters, you get this incredible picture. If you read the 36 chapters in the middle, there is a huge amount of man's wisdom being given and given and given, and it's all rubbish. There's a few verses in that 36 chapters where somebody gets something right, but most of that is man's wisdom. So we start off in the beginning, and here is Job. He's a very wealthy man. He's got lovely kids and, and flocks in the fields, a big house. and He loses all of that, and he loses his health. He gets covered in boils, and he's lost everything except his wife. And she is not happy with it. She, in fact, thinks that he should just die. That would be the best way out. So not a supportive wife. <laughs> um, and then in, he hear all these people come and try to give him answers and give him hope or blame him for what's happening or try to make sense in their heads of what has happened. And at the end, when Job has got angry with God, really, and his asking God, well, why did you let all this happen? And I and he's saying to God, I'm a righteous person. I've done everything you wanted. I, I didn't do anything wrong to make this happen to me. And he starts complaining and God comes along. The Bible says he came and answered him with a thundering voice. And he says, hang on a second, I'm going to ask you questions. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? You know, do you know where the wind comes from or the path where the light lives or where darkness goes and hides? And as the glory and the majesty and God is just revealed to Job, he comes to that place and he says, I'm talking about things I don't know. I am not worthy to even talk to you, God. 
Uh, but he says, but these three things I know. In Job 42, in the first five verses, he says three things. He says, one, I know that you can do all things. Two, I know that I spoke of things that I didn't understand, things that are much too wonderful for me to know, that you know, God. And the third thing he says is, my ears had heard of you. That is, you've always been like far away God, but I know all about you. But now you've come close and personal, and my eyes have seen you. So three things. I know that you're, you can do everything. I know you know everything. My eyes have seen you. I know you're a personal God who's going to be with me. Um, and I'm going to just break those three things down. The first thing is God is all-powerful. He's omniscient. He's, uh, Job said, I know, you, I know you can do anything at all. Colossians 1 says, For in him things, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, thrones, powers, rulers, authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. He's got the whole world in his hand. So God is at work in our situations. God is always at work. When he's doing something, right, then we know, right, when God's doing something, he's doing something. When he's not doing something, he's not doing something on purpose. So when he's doing something, he is doing something. When he's not doing something, he's actually doing something as well. Because he says, using what's going on in your life to bring you to a place where you are the person I need you to be for the destiny I've created you for. Oh, so when we're under pressure, maybe, uh, or we're depressed, or things are going wrong and we can't work it out, we've been asking for healing and it hasn't come in the timing that we're thinking it should come, God is doing a work. Let's ask God, not why aren't you fixing this, but what are you doing in my life? What are you doing in me? I'm watching my daughter as we have walked, a long walk. It's getting worse. And I can just see God using it in her life, drawing her to himself, releasing her into ministry, using, the, using her ability to keep her eyes on Jesus and not on the problem as a witness to people that makes people stop and ask, how can you do this? How can you still stand up? How can you still smile? How can you still manage? And it just gives her opportunity to tell people about Jesus. It's like, you know, when the eagles, we all know the story of the eagles, baby eagles in the nest. They're supposed to get out and fly, but they won't go. The, the mother bird will try to push them out. Often they will not go. So what the mother eagle does is she starts taking all the nice soft stuff out of the nest. So in there, there's only sticks that stick in the babies, and then they will leave the nest. And sometimes God says, yes, you're going through something. I am walking with you through it. There is a purpose. There is a purpose. Stop, ask, stop asking me to take away, even with Paul. Isn't there something that God, he asked God three times to take away? God said, no, no, no. Um, my grace is sufficient for you. I was reading. Um, I was reading about this Russian guy. It reminds me of Paul. I can't remember his name now because I haven't got it written down. Yeah. Um, in the 80s and 90s, he was preaching in Russia, and they were making cassette tapes of his sermons, and they were sending them everywhere. And the, the Russian authorities were determined to stop this. He'd been in jail a few times, and they had decided to kill him. So they told him, right? They arrested him the last time. They said, "This is it. We're going to kill you." because we want to stop your preaching having any value. And the guy said to them, oh, well, if you kill me, my blood will be on all those cassettes and they will go through the whole country and you will not be able to stop the revival. And they didn't kill him. And I feel that that was Paul's attitude when anything was going wrong. You know, he said, put me in jail? Oh, well, I wanted the Philippian jailer to be 
saved, and now he's saved. Oh, you're going to put me in jail again? Well, that's all right. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to write these letters to the churches about joy and about Jesus. And, and I'll have time to do that because you put me in jail. When they said to Paul, we're going to kill you, and he said, oh, well, that was just save me from trying to make up my mind this great dilemma I'm in, whether it would be better to say, stay here and keep serving God or it would be better to die and just be with Jesus. Thank you for making the decision for me. You cannot touch somebody who knows who Jesus is and knows that Jesus means what he says and that's what he's going to do. Amen. Yes? Yeah. Um, Jesus, and God is all powerful and whatever situation you're in right now, God sees you, he knows the situation, he can deliver you, he may choose to walk with you through it. And our place um, is to just know that he is all powerful and we can trust him. That's the omnipotence of God. How do we how do we learn to trust the omnipotence of God? Well, the first thing is it's found in his word. We just read his word. You read about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and you go, wow, God just delivered them. And you can go through the Bible. There's so many stories. And the greatest predictor of what somebody is going to do is what they did in the past. Yeah? So we learn, as we read his word, we see that he's always faithful. He's always in control. He can do anything. He can part the sea. If we come to a dead end, he can just part the sea so that we can go through. He's all-powerful and we can trust him. The second thing we need to know is that he's omniscient. He's all-knowing. Right? So Job said, I'm talking about things that are too wonderful for me to know. You know them, God. I don't know them. I have to stop complaining because I don't know what you know. I don't see the bigger picture. Think about it. If we could understand everything about God and he fitted into our brain, he'd have to be a really small God. But he is so big. And some things we will never understand until we see him face to face. I haven't got that scripture written down, but there's a scripture that says, at the moment I see like in a mirror, like a cloudy mirror. Um, when I look... But I believe as we study um, his word and we come to him in prayer and we get to know what we know what we know, that that mirror gets clearer and clearer and clearer. We can see more and more. We never see everything. We never understand everything until we see him face to face. And then we're going to go, oh, that's why you do that. Like, that's why that happened. That's why... My dad died when he died because you were saving him from this thing that was coming and you just said, come on home, love. Right? And we won't know that till we get there. It's going to be so exciting. But he knows everything. He knows everything about you. He knows everything that's going to happen. He knows every prayer you're going to pray before you pray it. So we go, why do we pray? Because we need to learn to trust the omniscience of God and it's found in that place of prayer. Because I come to God in the morning and I say, this is all the stuff that I'm worried about today and I'm giving it to you, God. Right? I know you already know, I'm giving it to you. Because my problem can't be God's problem. If I give it to God, it's God's problem and it's not my problem anymore. If I hang on to it and it's my problem, then it's not God's problem. So we come and we give it to him in prayer. Right? And that's where we learn the omniscience of God. This is where we learn that he can speak to my daughter through somebody in a prayer meeting who has no idea what she's doing and give her a picture that proves to her, like just affirms to her that God is with her. He knows what you need before you even ask. We just need to trust him and know know that we can bring everything to him in prayer and he will work on our behalf. The third thing that I believe that came out of that Job uh, Job chapter 37 is he said, my ears have heard about you and now I know you. Now my eyes have seen you. We have to come close. That God is omnipresent. He is always always here. And the verse says, I'll never leave you and I will never forsake you. Do we believe that? Mm. 
And how do we learn to walk in the omnipresence of God? We discover the omnipresence of God in worship. If I can't feel him, if I, all I have to do is worship. He inhabits the praises of his people. If I'm not sure if I'm walking with him today, just worship him. He is there. We can worship him all day. We can worship him in lots of ways, not just singing. We can worship him at work. We can worship him washing up at home. We can worship him with everything we do, everything we choose, with our voices, with our thoughts, with our speech, with our actions. Everything can be a worship unto God. And when we worship constantly, then we will know he is with us constantly. There is no worse feeling than feeling that I'm totally alone. It's a horrible place to be. And yet I can shut my eyes and go, God, I worship you, and he's there. And I know he's there. And I, I need to know that I know that he's there when I can't tangibly feel him. I need to learn to trust that he's there, whatever is going on. And it, it's just so amazing uh, the things that he does for us. And I'm just, you know, I'm just trying to think because I've never got any of my notes here. <laughs> um, of times when God has just been so real to me. I remember when we moved to Bellbrook and I didn't want to go and I, we had no electricity and no hot water or anything. And I bought a boiler, like a big boiler thing that you could put on a fire to boil the hot water. And it was in the back of, on the back of my car and as I came out of the corner, the lid flew off silly story, right? The leaf flew off. And I stopped the car, and I, I'm looking alongside the road, and God spoke to me, honestly, so clearly, and he said, you're looking on the wrong side of the road, it's over there, up there. And I thought, well, that's not right, I come around this corner, it's got to be here. Right? Because I always say, when you're arguing with yourself, you're probably arguing with God. Because you're arguing, like, some, and I walked back where he said, and there was the lid. I thought, God is amazing. He's, he even cared about my lid, you know? Like, um, but he's done amazing things. He knows everything. He's always here. We're going home from church one day on the old Algomera Road. Does anyone remember what that was like? Mm -hmm. I'm going home in the dark on that old road. There's nowhere to pull off on either side. There's trees. There's lots of accidents there all the time. And I'm going around the eye from this 35k bend and my bonnet flew up. Now, I didn't know my bonnet had flown up because it's dark. All I know is suddenly I can't see anything at all. It's completely, I've gone blind. So I stop the car. I get out of the car and I, I, as I've tried to see, I've switched off all the lights. So I've got a dark blue car, no lights on. It's dark. I'm on this 35k bend. I get out of the car, the bonnet's up and I can't move the wrong thing. I tried really hard, I couldn't move it. And as I looked up, there's a truck on that side of the road, and there's a truck behind me. So I got into the car to die with my children. Because how can you go home without the children? <laughs> Those trucks never went past my car. I don't know if God picked my car up, if the truck went through my car, I don't know. But neither of them went past my car. That was a miracle. God is always. When I realised that these trucks are not, I mean, I must don't know how long I sat there because I'm, I'm sitting there waiting to die. When I realised there's no trucks anymore, I get out of the car, I eventually got the bonnet down, eventually got home. And my husband said, God will stop looking after you if you keep being so stupid. <laughs> But God is there when we least expect it. I mean, I wasn't praying, I wasn't worshipping, I wasn't doing anything right. God was just there. Amen. And we need to know that he is always in our lives, that he is always with us, that he is always, always there when we need him. And we find that place. We find that knowledge. We find in that place of worship. And you see in the Bible, like when they come to um, Elisha and they say, we want a word from God. He says, well, play me some music. Let me just worship for a moment. And then he has words from God, prophetic words that 
you know, to have changed the, the course of history for that nation, basically. So we see that over and over. Where did David learn to stand up to Goliath? Well, David was a man of worship. In that place of worship, God can just impart into us um, everything that we need. Just thinking because I know there was a bit more. But this is this morning. We just need to know that we know that we know. If you don't know, if you don't know, then get into his word and get into prayer and get into worship. Because this is where we meet him and we know him. And if we will stay in those three places, and this is so important today, if you're not in his word, you'll believe the stuff they're saying on the TV and on the news, and so much of it is not true. But we don't need to look at it. If we stay in his word, he will reveal to us what we need to know and what's important. The thing I will say is I believe times are urgent, that we need to be strong, that we need to be prepared if persecution comes. We need to have prepared our hearts and prepared our minds and we walk in his presence so that we can stand against anything and rejoice like Paul did. Let me just finish in prayer today. Father, I just thank you that you are so wonderful. Our minds cannot even start to comprehend how wonderful you are. I thank you that you're all powerful, that you're all knowing but that you love us so much that you are always, always with us. Help us, Father, to walk so closely to you that whatever should come against us, we will be able to rest, rejoice, and be confident in everything that you would have us walk through. We just love you. We want our lives to honour you. And Father, as we walk in that place of being so confident in you, I just ask that people would see that and be drawn to you, Jesus, that you would give us opportunity to be witnesses to your love and to your power, to your goodness and your kindness, that you would just draw people to yourself, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.